Hello, and welcome to the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries Presidential Update. I'm Annette Spencer. I'm the Director of Public Affairs and Research at the IFOA. And this morning, here in the UK anyway, it's my pleasure to introduce this update event. The purpose of this session is for our president, uh, Tan Sui Che, to provide you all with an update on the progress of both the organisation and the profession since his inaugural presidential address last June. A midterm report, if you will. In a moment, I will pass you across to Sui Che. But first, a quick reminder that we would welcome your questions throughout this session, and we will be allowing time in the second half of the session uh, to try and get through as many of those questions as we can. You can ask a question in this session by using the Q&A function that you should be able to see somewhere on your Zoom screen. So simply send your question through by typing it in uh, on the Q&A panel um, and, uh, and I and the president will be able to see your questions. So our president probably needs very little introduction these days. Originally from Malaysia, Sui Che is a graduate of the London School of Economics and he enjoyed a successful career for over 20 years with Prudential, firstly in London um, and then in Malaysia and Singapore. More latterly, he served as the CEO of NTUC Income and then the NTUC Enterprise Group as a whole. He was elected to the IFOA's council in 2017 and to the presidential team as president-elect in 2019. I am delighted to invite Sui Che to present his presidential updates. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening from here in Singapore. I'm delighted to be joined by so many of you around the world for this presidential update. It has been slightly more than six months since I became your president in an extraordinary year. And I want to give you a progress update on the five pillars of change that I spoke about in my presidential address back in June. Also, I I want to describe to you how my own understanding, appreciation and engagement with the IFOA deepens as we continue our journey and develop our narrative. Most importantly, I would like to remind you of the journey we have started. We need to reinvent the actual profession for the 21st century so that we can be relevant, influential and impactful in our workplace as well as to pursue our public interest role more effectively in a wider society. This is largely in response to a world of increasing radical uncertainty and to the digital revolution. As sustainability problems become ever more visible to society because of the COVID and climate crisis, the profession is uniquely placed to offer its thought leadership and to enable our members to do well and to do good in the public interest. This narrative is the heart of the VSMD strategy. The vision, skill sets, mindsets, domains of VSMD strategy that I highlighted in my presidential address is the culmination of the work of the last three years and is entirely consistent with the presidential themes of the last five years. From Colin Wilson and his work on thought leadership, particularly on the theme of intergenerational fairness. Marjorie Goenya and her drive to encourage the profession to be adaptable and be future ready. Jules Constantino and his call for actuaries to step out of the shadows and to ensure the voice of the F profession is heard. And most recently, John Taylor and his advocacy of the strategic relevance of data science and fairness in consumer finance. The changes I call for in my address cannot be completed in one year. As we emerge from the defining year of COVID-19, we have a compelling and coherent narrative for transformational change. It speaks to the profound changes taking place in our world 
COVID-19 encourages us to accelerate our change, not to defer or slow it down. These changes are fundamental, urgent, possible, and necessary for the profession to thrive. The world is changing rapidly. We must respond with clear purpose, coherence, and agility. I would like to signal that these changes are transformational and not incremental, and we must not and we must lose neither pace nor momentum. The narrative must continue to receive attention in the next two to three years for real change to take root. It is in this context and in this spirit that I give you my update. My summary to you today is simple and can be given in one line. Meaningful and important progress has been made in a difficult and challenging 2020. And we all know that there's still much more work to be done for the transformation of the IFOA and of the profession to be secure. Now I would like to give you an update on the five pillars enunciated in my presidential address in June last year. The first pillar is on thought leadership. In June, I shared with you that one of my main priorities is to revive the spirit of the profession as a learned society and to bring thought leadership to the foreground once again. I believe the role of the president is to recognize our thought leaders and to celebrate their achievements and to ensure that the IFOA is a place for them to thrive. In my short time as incoming president and president, I have had the good fortune to meet many members of the IFOA who have a point of view, have ideas and want to make a difference. They are our thought leaders. We must give them the forum, the space, and the attention for them to flourish, we must encourage them to step out of the shadows. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and to thank these thought, leader, thought leaders and influencers for their scholarship, thought leadership, and expertise. I will now mention a few members whom I know personally and all with whose work I'm familiar. Stuart McDonald. or actually by the day, as he is known in the Twitter sphere, emerged as one of the profession's definitive voices on all things COVID. From becoming the BBC more or less program's favourite actuary, to comments in the Wall Street Journal, Stuart has demonstrated there is a great demand for actual insight and analysis that is clear, concise, and presented in a form that is easily understood by the public. Well done, Stuart. Matthew Edwards, Colin Dukowitz, Nicola Oliver, Matt Fletcher, Dan Ryan, Joseph Liu, Chris Martin, John Roberts, Luis Rosso, and many others continue to lead the way in thinking through some of the difficult, topical, and controversial areas of COVID-19 with passion, dedication, expertise, and impact. I extend my appreciation and recognition of them, of them. Scholar practitioners, Craig Turnbull and Andrew Smith are significant and established scholar practitioners in our midst. Craig for his magisterial work on the history, methodology and philosophy of actual science, as well as work on technical actual matters. Andrew for his impressive track record on financial, modeling and financial economics. Pioneering work over sustained period. Charles Cowling for his seminal work on discounting and RPI reform. Zainal Kasim of Malaysia for his unrivaled international authority on, on all things actuarial on Takaful insurance. As an aside, I'm pleased to inform you that Zainal V. Govin and I form a very diverse multiracial Malaysian team to be the first actuaries to complete the fellowship examinations of the then Institute of Actuaries in 1984. Now to actuaries changing mindsets. Sally Bridgeland for her original and long-term thinking in investments and advocacy of mathematics. Chika Agadino for her thoughtfulness, steadfastness and courage in speaking up on diversity in the profession. Marissa Hall 
for the integration of psychology, finance, and investments in analyzing financial products. Actuaries breaking new ground. Ronald Richmond of South Africa for leading the thinking on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Nicholas Yeo of Malaysia for the application of artificial intelligence in actual techniques. 2020 has been a year in which we have redefined the way we do things. One of the most rewarding aspects of my presiden presidency is that I, that I also got to know some of our colleagues whose passionate conviction is that transformational change is necessary to address the sustainability issues of our time. And in, and in a year of COVID, I have spent many hours on Zoom with them and learned a great deal in the process. I want to celebrate them and to bring their names to the foreground. Louise Pryor, my presidential colleague, for her deep thinking and conviction of the need to avert a climate calamity. Nick Spencer of the Sustainability Board, for his passion and drive in championing sustainability and diversity. Ashok Gupta, Sam Accord and Neil Kentel of the FinStick, the IFOA's Financial Innovation and Systems Thinking Innovation Center for their advocacy of integrating systems thinking into actual practice and pioneering work on emerging risks. Oliver Bettis and Martin White of the Economic Member Interest Group for instigating the transformation of the profession's thinking on our existing economic theory and systems. Nico Espinel and Nick Silva for their individualistic radical thinking in challenging conventional investment paradigms. It is also my privilege as your president to be recommended actuaries who are doing good work currently to develop ideas and promoting the profession, but without me necessarily knowing them personally. I have it on good authority that these individuals deserve mention as thought leaders and experts in their respective areas and are advancing the frontiers of actuarial science. Melinda Strudwick, Tim Johnson, Patrick Kaliha, Gwaram Mehta. Next, Agratas Mukherjee and Lisa Morgan. Daniel Clark, Sean Lazari. Next, Alan Reed, Cliff Speed, James Sharp, Alexandra Mouse, and John Southall. I am fully aware that my list is not comprehensive nor completely objective. And the list is less diverse and international than we would all like. We can correct this over time. In any case, I want to hear from you if you think there are names I have missed. In this update, I would not want to debate the definition of thought leadership, but I do want to mention three Greek words, logos, ethos, and pathos. Logos is our logical argument and analysis. Ethos is about our trustworthiness and credibility to speak on a subject. Pathos is our ability to engage and influence the wider world with feeling. Our actual tendency is to stick to our logos, less to establishing our ethos and effecting our pathos. As we go about expanding our profession's influence, let us bear in mind that our thought leadership and our influence require us to be strong in each of these legs. The COVID-19 pandemic turns out to be a powerful catalyst in reminding us what our public interest duty truly is and what we stand for as a profession and thus providing the opportunity for change. Given our quintessential nature, our strength is our logos, but to win hearts and minds and extend our influence in society, we have to be bolder and more imaginative in strengthening our ethos and pathos. We have made some progress in this regard. And here are some of the more meaningful highlights. 
As a response to the uncertainty created by the pandemic, we reached out to the UK SAGE, Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, to offer our actual support in responding to the scourge of the pandemic. Our initiative was well received, leading to the engagement with ONS, the Office for National Statistics, and the Department of Health and Social Care in the UK on a regular and sustained basis, collaborating to produce evidence for SAGE. We have also reached out and reset our relationship with two of our closest key stakeholders, our colleagues at the UK Government Actuaries Department, the GAD, and the Financial Reporting Council, the FRC, which will be succeeded by ARGA, the Audit Reporting and Governance Authority. I welcome the renewed shared desire for working together with GAD to widen our collective influence and in our engagement with the FRC, we have adopted a new proactive approach led by council member Andy Rea to work towards a future regulatory framework for IFOA members, which is not only robust, but relevant, practical, and proportionate. We are also very pleased and proud that our immediate past president, John Taylor, has been appointed to the Prudential Regulatory Committee of the Bank of England. This is the most significant appointment, which will ensure that the voice of actuaries will continue to be heard at the highest levels of regulatory decision-making. Many congratulations and well done, John. We have also instigated a new project, Project Renaissance, to engage different groups of, shareholders, of stakeholders of the IFOA, including the past president of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries by establishing the President Emeritus Group and also senior members of the profession who otherwise would not be engaged. The purpose is very simply to tap into their rich reservoir of experience, insight and knowledge and enroll them in our collective work to secure the future of our profession. As well as senior volunteers, we also want to hear from our younger members around the world and from the employers of our members. And so in 2021, we'll be establishing young actuaries and employers forums to ensure their perspectives are reflected in our work. In 2021, the IFOA will also be pursuing a refreshed approach towards hosting forums on thought leadership. The new approach seeks to reposition the IFOA at the center of some of the key debates of our time. Some of these debates are profoundly actuarial, some reach out beyond our traditional actuarial world. This is in keeping with our VSMD strategy and our desire for actuaries to access and influence new domains. The first event is on 26th of January with Professor Andrew Scott, joint author of The 100-Year Life and The New Long Life. Professor Andrew Scott will engage us on how longer lives and new technologies will fundamentally reshape the economy and how we need to reinvent our lives to flourish. We have a whole host of other fantastic thought leaders lined up over the next few months, including former joint head of UK Economic Service, Vicky Price, Professor Keith Grint of Oxford State Business School and Professor Sir Adrian Smith, CEO of the Alan Turing Institute and the President of the Royal Society. We will also bring together renowned figures to explore whether the current financial system is still fit for purpose. For example, speakers including renowned author and journalist John Kay from the Financial Times and Andy Haldane, Chief Economist at the Bank of England will share their perspectives over several days in March under the banner Finance in the Public Interest. The IFOA's Great Risk Transfer Campaign will accelerate in early 2021 with the publication of the final report and its recommendations. John Taylor will continue to lead the conversation on this important initiative. Commencing in April, the IFOA will, host, will be hosting a fortnight of COVID-related thought leadership events, 
our colleagues from both the IOA COVID-19 Action Task Force, ICAT, and the COVID-19 Actuaries Response Group will explain their work to our membership as well as to the external world in an imaginative and impactful way. The eyes of the world will turn to Glasgow in November 2021, where the 26th United Nations Climate Conference or COP26 will take place. As humanity renews our collective action against the climate crisis, the IFOA Council in November last year pledged full support for the aims of the Paris Agreement and most consequentially agreed to commit the IFOA to be operationally net zero in carbon emissions by 2030. In this defining issue of climate change, President-elect Louis Pryor will be leading a range of the IFOA events, including one next month with Sarah Gordon, CEO of the Impact Investing Institute, as part of our overall campaign on climate policy. I know a single solo does not a summer make. A series of events will not reposition the profession and extend our influence. But I believe this series of events does bring the whole notion and idea of thought leadership to the attention of the IFOA and the profession until the real summer arrives. If we continue to celebrate and bring thought leadership to the foreground and change the way we think about ourselves, we will begin to change and extend our influence. I am confident of this. I hope this new approach inspires you to come forward and get involved in our work in repositioning the profession. The second pillar. The second pillar is our vision, skill set, mindsets, domains, or VSMD strategy that we have to implement with pace and urgency. In May 1961, John F. Kennedy said to Congress that it should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a moon on a, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Nikki, you could uh, unshare. Uh, this became known as the moonshot and has come to describe any bold project which starts without having all the answers, but in a belief that we have the capability, resources, and imagination to deliver it. In recent times, all kinds of projects have been given the codename Moonshot to capture this spirit. This inspired the IFOA leadership team to form our own project Moonshot. Soon after my presidential address, I have to quickly add, this was done seven months ago, before the word Moonshot has entered the contemporary British press lexicon to describe a certain behavior in political circles recently. But anyway, under this project, now more prosaically referred to as the Learning Change Program, we agreed on the philosophical and operational, and operational approach towards implementing the learning aspects of the VSMD strategy for both existing and new generation of actuaries. This strategy is critical if we, as a profession, are to remain relevant and impactful in our professional lives and how we exercise our public interest duty. In that sense, it is truly our profession's moonshot. Specifically, we agreed to the following undertakings. A significant shift in the focus of our learning from pre-qualification examinations to lifelong professional learning. Members uh, taking greater ownership, I think it's the previous slide, yeah. Members taking greater ownership over their professional learning throughout their careers with a wider choice of learning options. And thirdly, learning to be based on a digital first philosophy, enabling it to reach members wherever they wish to learn and wherever they are located, whenever they wish to learn and wherever they are located. Fourthly, change in our pre-qualification curriculum from professional legacy to future need, we should be quick to market. Next, learning content delivered in partnership with external organization which bring sector learning competencies. A dynamic approach which is flexible, allowing us 
to future demands and changes in the actual profession. We will be, um, uh, the pre, uh, just go to uh, the screen uh, without the slides. Yeah. Uh, we will be increasing data science and machine learning content within our existing pre-qualification curriculum and we'll be introducing certificated lifelong learning on climate risk and a fellowship pathway on banking over the next two years. The leadership of Project Moonshot is now in the hands of the executive team. Now the third pillar. Uh, Nikki. My slight apologies for this. Um, the third pillar is we encourage the IFOA executive team to accelerate their cultural transformation. Let me say this again. If we, do, if we do not succeed in the transformation of the IFOA, we will not make progress in our ambition to be member-centric and to achieve our BSMD strategy. Thank you. We have an elephant in the room. The IFOA has not been member-centric, not responsive, and has too often been too slow in getting things done. The words used are bureaucratic, slow, like triacle. Many of us know and agree with this, but let us make this a story of the past. We are on a journey to transform the IFOA. I believe that, that an open and authentic admission of the situation will help us to solve the problem. Despite COVID-19, the IFOA executive team have begun to make positive and significant inroads. I would like to share 10 highlights that directly impact our students and our members. And I will, I will divide them into three categories, strategic and groundbreaking, engagement and communications, operational and customer service related. Strategic and groundbreaking initiatives. One, successfully moving in-person examinations to an online format, becoming the only global actuarial organization to do so in April 2020, is the most significant and consequential achievement by the IFOA team in 2020. The two, the IFOA also quickly transformed our events offering to fully online with a wider range of content. This has enabled many more members in many different locations to participate in such events. The pandemic and societal responses to it will result in permanent shifts in customer preferences and buying behavior, business models, and ways of working. As a body, the IFOA will press on with our digital journey. Engagement and communications initiatives. Three, Stephen Mann, the IFOA's CEO, embraced the opportunity to engage employers personally with impressive energy. He has met with over 60 employers in the UK and overseas market. Output from this will feed into our strategy execution and our membership value proposition. I see this as of great significance as what our leadership gives attention to will shape the priorities of the organization. Four, the leadership team has engaged very widely in town halls with members across the world and in many different conferences via, via the IFOA channels and the social media. Five, a new blog platform accessible from our own homepage and a new more contemporary Free website for the Actuary magazine. As a body, the IFOA and our members are increasingly active in our use of online and social media to reach members and to win hearts and minds of our stakeholders. The COVID-19 Actuaries Response Group continue to engage proactively with more than 5,000 and 11,000 followers in LinkedIn and Twitter respectively. The IFOA blog platform LinkedIn and Twitter are ideal platforms for our emerging and established thought leaders to assert our logos, ethos, and pathos. Let us be bolder in experimenting using these avenues. 
operational and customer service related initiatives. Six, the, from March 2020, we introduced an online version of the student application form. As a result, we are able to reduce the manual process, usually completed over several days or sometimes weeks into a convenient 20 to 30 minute online process. So far, 800 applicants have benefited from this new process. Seven, another process improvement is that any member applying for the reduced rate subscription option can now extend their continuation with a minimum of funds, requiring a simple declaration instead of submitting the whole application again. Over 6,000 members will benefit from this process simplification annually. Seven, and eight, in September last year, we launched a new exemption facility which enables students to apply and track online the exemptions they are eligible for. As a result, their exemption application can, can now be processed much more, much faster than previously. Nine, we have adopted a new philosophy for satisfying CPD requirements. We have removed a bureaucratic checklist approach which relies on compliance culture to one which is more focused on outcomes. This is entirely consistent with our new approach to learning by encouraging personal responsibility and ownership. Lastly, 10, we have also weathered the crisis well from a financial point of view with our financial performance better than expected in a challenger year, challenging year. As a body, the IVOA is transforming into a passionate, decisive and commercially savvy member-centric organization. We still have work to do, but 2020 has been a busy and pivotal year with some fantastic achievements. These achievements are remarkable because they were attained despite COVID-19. To achieve this in a year where there is reason for despair, anxiety and fatigue is remarkable and praiseworthy. However, we can also reframe this all these achievements were also made more possible because of COVID-19. Our backs were to the wall. Our financial situation was truly vulnerable and we have an ambitious transformation program ahead of us. All this forced us to be creative and decisive in ways we were not used to. We thrived despite the crisis. We thrived because of the crisis. Both are true. In the Chinese language, the word crisis, wei qi, is made up of two words, danger, wei xian, and opportunity, qi hui. The people in the IVOA have responded to the crisis, wei qi, by seizing the opportunity, qi hui, and avoiding the danger, wei xian, with quick thinking, resilience, and clear purpose. I am increasingly encouraged by the motivation of the IFOA executive team despite the obvious challenges they face working remotely and in challenging circumstances. The engagement score in the staff survey increased from 56% in 2019 to 72% in a difficult 2020. The executives and staff at the IFOA, led by Stephen Mann, responded smartly, passionately, and with purpose. My sincere thanks to all of you on behalf of the members of the IFOA. Thank you. The energies, flow, and motivation of the IFOA executive team can only be sustained at high levels if all of us are committed to the higher purpose and narrative of the IFOA and the profession. I'm already sensing new energy and an increased willingness in IFOA to experiment and to try new things. The IFOA can be a responsive, passionate, commercially savvy and decisive high performance organization. I passionately believe we can and we will. I would like to add what happened in the past was a result of the choices we have made collectively over the years and the behaviors we model 
as a profession. It is certainly not the fault of any individual executive. If you want to see serious change, the governing body, the council, and the leadership have to lead the way. Show the example and be coherent in our guidance and in our strategy. Our role as leaders as, and as members of the IFOA is to encourage this change and to help in this process. It was Gandhi who said, be the change you want to see in the world. If you want to see the change in the IFOA, we, the members, have to change in the way we think and talk about the IFOA, in the way we allow and encourage the IFOA to change, in the way we communicate, congratulate, and celebrate changes when they take place, in the way we allow IFOA to make mistakes and to learn from them, in the way we ourselves learn from our mistakes and learn from each other, in the way we place our attention, care, and love on the IFOA to ensure no harm comes to it. All this because the IFOA is us. It is our professional body. Pillar four, governance reform. The fourth pillar is we reappraise with courage and imagination the governance arrangements of the IFOA. For too long, the governance arrangements of the IFOA have not worked well. Independent directors and senior actuaries outside the IFOA have lamented to me about the size and the role of the council, the tenure of the presidency, and the Byzantine arrangements of our governance processes. I call it the IFOA's labyrinth. In the last six months, we have been busy cutting down this labyrinth. Under the leadership of Graham Stott, Chair of the IFOA's Management Board, we have made important progress through an initiative known as Project Galaxy, where we have set in motion changes to both our corporate boards and practice boards. The Council has approved the dissolution of four corporate boards, the Lifelong Learning Board, the Research and Thought Leadership Board, the Public Affairs Board, and the Markets Development Board. In their place will be more flexible working committees under the direction of the Management Board. I want to make it absolutely clear that these reforms are not a reflection of the quality, integrity, or capability of the chairpersons and the independent directors of these boards. In the past years, we have not used the time and expertise of our independent directors well. I want to place on record my appreciation and thanks to four outstanding individuals and leaders, Dr. Helen Wright, Dr. Beate Deegan, the Right Honourable David Heath and Eric Vinkia for their sterling efforts and cooperation in supporting reform. And my thanks also extend to the independent directors and the IFOA members on these boards. External expertise will remain vital in the years to come, but there's still a lot of serious work to do. Our plan is to do this in a practical and more imaginative man uh, manner. The practice boards will be encouraged to be more focused in engaging members, developing thought leadership and thinking across practice areas. Project Galaxy has another strand which considers potential reforms to the two main organs of the IFOA, namely the Council and Management Board. It is important that the roles of these two bodies are clear and aid efficiency in governance. The length of the IFOA presidency, the tenure of the council members and the size and composition of our, of our council membership are all matters for potential consideration. It is not yet clear that we will begin the process of looking at all these aspects of Galaxy in my presidential term. Council members' views on these issues are diverse in a very healthy way. My own inclination is that we should go for more fundamental reforms 
But to do this, we must have the steadfastness and cohesion to see this through. If these changes are to take place, the process will extend into Louis' presidential year. Pillar 5. Cultural transformation of the profession. Finally, the fifth pillar. As a profession, we must embark on a cultural transformation to create room for curiosity, adaptability, courage, judgment, imagination, and growth mindset. In many ways, this is by far the most difficult and nebulous of the pillars. This is because this is about us as actuaries and the profession. We are the fly in the fly bottle and we need to find a way out of the bottle. We need greater diversity, diversity of mindsets. This goes to the heart of the VSMD strategy. There is no doubt that our core values of accuracy, cautiousness, consistency, and reticence must be the bedrock of the many roles we play, and that must remain the case. But in today's world, it is clearly insufficient to rely on this bedrock alone. Our core values will not enable us to thrive in the digital revolution, nor in a world of radical uncertainty and systemic changes which engulf us. These challenges require us to have innovative, and systemic mindsets and not an overly cautious and systematic mindset. For this to happen, we need to bring to the foreground the qualities of curiosity, adaptability, courage, imagination, and judgment. The success of this pillar depends on the leadership team, the management board, and the council exemplifying these values. You go to video, uh, Nikki. No, video. For my colleagues at the leadership team, management board and council, as we cut down the labyrinth and find our way out of the fly bottle, it is worth considering the following questions. Are our actions and decisions smart and savvy, commercially as well as actually, or are we always looking for 100% consensus? Are we sufficiently curious and adaptable in the way we solve our problems? Are we decisive and courageous in expressing what we believe? Are we imaginative enough in what we believe is possible? Are we adopting a learning and growth mindset of experimentation instead of looking for 100% correct answers? And ultimately, are we doing all these things with good judgment? The profession is the mother of the IFOA. The membership elects the council, which is the supreme body, and the supreme body has created a management board to govern the operations of the IFOA. The Byzantine processes and structures we have put in place led to diffuse responsibility and absence of ownership. They are our creations. We are starting to find a way to fly out of this fly bottle. But for this, for the change to secure this council and future councils, you will need to continue to provide clarity of strategic purpose consistency and coherence of message and stewardship to perpetuate the narrative for change, the quality and diversity of the composition of council, of council matters. My appeal today is really to the members of the IFOA, to all of you who have the capability, the experience, the time and the resources to come forward to stand for election to our council and to those bodies which are influential within the IFOA and help secure the future of the profession. 
In conclusion, let us remind ourselves of our central narrative. As a profession, we want to be relevant, influential and impactful in our workplace and speak to our public interest role in wider society authoritatively. This is in response to the digital revolution and the radical uncertainty which engulfs us. We need to widen our skill sets and diversify our mindsets. We need thought leadership, curiosity, adaptability, courage, imagination, and judgment. This is the heart of the VSMD strategy. And for the VSMD strategy to be realized, we have to address the culture of the IFOA and to transform our governance arrangements. Let us continue to press ahead and make 2021 the year of transformation. Let us remain inspired to achieve our purpose and steadfast in our mutual obligations and be passionate in our journey of transformation and reinvention. And let us remember the actuary who is only an actuary is not an actuary. And let us remember we will achieve our purpose if we care more than others think it is wise. Expect more than others think it is possible. Be bolder than others think it is safe. Imagine more than others think it is practical. Thank you for your listening and I wish you all a fulfilling 2021. Thank you very much, Sui Che. I, I think that's been a very uh, interesting session, particularly to hear the breadth of the different uh, ways in which progress has been made. Uh, so um, I, it, certainly I, I have found this a very interesting thing to, to work through and I'm sure the, the participants uh, who are listening in have as well. Um, I'm just going to remind uh, the delegates, uh, obviously we still have uh, uh, some time and there was a, a lot of detail in what the president has covered. Um, I can see that there are um, quite a few questions starting to come through, uh, but please do send us uh, your, your questions if you want to. Um, the way that we're doing that is we're asking you to type them into the Q&A function um, and then they appear immediately on my screen. Um, so please do, uh, if you haven't already, please do send through any questions that you might have. Um, and in the next sort of half an hour or so, um, I, my job is, is going to be to try and put as many of those questions as I can um, to, uh, to the president. So um, Suiche, hopefully you've had a chance uh, to catch your, your breath now. Um, I, I thought we might dive straight into the questions, if that's okay. Thank you, Annette. I'm ready. Excellent. Um, so um, I, I'm going to start with quite a general question. Um, I mean, obviously, this uh, this update really marks the kind of halfway point in your presidential year. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, what have you enjoyed most so far about the year? And also, I guess, what has been the most challenging or difficult aspect? So the high and the low of your experience so far? Overall, I've uh, uh, enjoyed my role tremendously because uh, of the prestige of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, uh, without doubt. Uh, and I think on a more personal level, I, I, I enjoyed the engagement uh, uh, with the people in Zimbabwe uh, when we were there as a president-elect, uh, with the people in Kuala Lumpur and China, in Hong Kong, and of course in Belfast. Uh, I enjoy meeting the students and I see uh, the future actuaries yeah, uh, who are so eager and so wanting to learn. Uh, that was a great part. And enjoyment also extended to members of the council and the more senior members of the profession. I had a chance to refresh my own uh, thinking uh, in meeting with people in COVID-19, uh, who are involved in COVID-19 and also some of the thought leadership. It's a great opportunity. Uh, and also working with uh, the people in IFOA uh, we, we have diverse views and, and, uh, and sometimes we disagree, but there's no doubt, there's no doubt in my mind, everyone uh, wants the best for IFOA. And, and the integrity and the, sen the, the intention, uh, the good intent of every council member is, uh, is very visible. 
and, and that is the part which I enjoy most. And I miss most is not going to, uh, to London because I do enjoy uh, the not so formal parts. Uh, but Zoom and, and meetings in Blue Jean does have its benefits, which we can talk about later. But in this context, engagement is, is, is the, the most rewarding part of my presidency. But on the, on the more difficult part is building uh, coherence, yeah? coherence uh, uh, of the narrative. Uh, uh, because we, we are a diverse group, uh, coherence, building uh, coherence and, and governance. And here, I'm extremely fortunate to have uh, Graham Stott and Stephen Mann on my side, and also uh, like-minded presidential colleagues. Uh, although we have diverse views, uh, we, we seem to come to an inflection point where we feel that we should build and take advantage of this inflection point to create lasting change. Uh, but it's still difficult because governance revolves a lot of processes and enrolling of people and many conversations. That was the difficult part, but it was also engaging in its own way. It's difficult, but nevertheless, uh, enjoyable uh, still, yeah. yeah. I can't hear you. I'm still on mute. I'm sorry. I was saying I was getting a sense that you uh, that, that overall, you, you, mainly you found the experience enjoyable, despite with some of the challenges that we that we've had to face. Yes, I I, I would say it is. Uh, I I, uh, I was preparing a question for a seminar for Malaysia later this week about highlights. You know, I, I didn't plan to be president, but when looking back, maybe. 20, 30 years time, you know, when I look back, this must be a highlight. Uh, it is a joy to be associated with a profession which has such history and such prestige. But at the same time, uh, we have many challenges, many challenges, but also a great opportunity before us. Yeah. So uh, I, I think we are, uh, in a way, we are very fortunate and blessed to be in this space, to be able to make a difference. Uh, uh, personally, uh, as well as uh, as a group of individuals, there are people who really care, especially at this time uh, where, where, where society is in search of answers. But I do not want to overplay that card because uh, everyone wants to have a point of view. Uh, but I was also very taken by some of the wiser senior actuaries who say that it's not about just giving our answers, uh, but, but asking the right questions uh, and listening. Yeah? Uh, but I think that it is... Uh, a, a good time to be an actuary and to get involved, yeah, uh, in a, in a broader in a broader sense, yeah. That seems like a really excellent segue um, into the the first kind of uh, set of questions that I that I want to ask you next. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the way the last six months has been, we've had quite a few questions that, in some way or another, are are, are COVID themed. Um, so I wondered if we could just have a little chat about those. So um, I'm going to pull two or three of these together. Um, we've got one of the delegates who uh, was really interested in what you were saying in the update uh, about the work with the UK SAGE group and the way in which we've been trying to influence decision making. Um, but I think there's also a little bit of a, a challenge in there in that um, uh, this person is saying that uh, they actually think many people are still really unaware of the actuarial expertise and how that can help. And the question is really, what can we do to make sure that we have a higher profile uh, in helping people understand how to interpret what's going on and particularly to deal with uh, misinformation. Um, and we've also got someone who says they'd be interested to just understand more about what we are doing with the SAGE group and how actuaries are getting involved. So maybe you might want to take the second question and, the, and then move into the, the first question about what more we can do. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I could do that. Uh, uh, we, we actually, it came out uh, in a Twitter conversation uh, uh, and, 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 and someone asked, why is, uh, why is the IVA not involved in SAGE? And I think I wrote to you if I, have, if I remember correctly, and they say, yeah, why don't we contact us, Sage? Uh, why don't we contact Sage? And we contact us, Sage, and we have people who have a point of view. And they did uh, ask us to a meeting, uh, which we did. Uh, I remember Colin Stewart and myself, we, we met two members of Sage. Uh, and subsequently, uh, they, I, I think uh, without over exaggerating it, they, they, they knew, they appreciated what we were saying. Uh, and very subsequently, I believe that uh, we are very involved with. Uh, the Office of National Statistics, yeah, which is uh, uh, which is under the direct 
action of the government's chief statistician. Uh, and, and, and then we went, and I think there have been constant dialogue. And I believe there was a significant paper published uh, last week, yeah, which were, uh, and because they needed some papers to be, to, to, uh, to be peer reviewed so that they could use it more formally. So, so those were the background. Um, and I think that there are many things which, uh, which are very detailed and it's something we could share. It's certainly available on the website, but we are organizing this, the webinar in March, April. Where we could share in a more uh, dynamic way. Uh, but in terms of um, the world is a cacophony of voices, yeah. So we can say that what we have is the most precious. And of course, you and I agree that we are most precious. But how we get the influence is not a function necessarily of the quality of work. It, we need to be uh, uh, smarter in promoting our work, positioning our work, getting our stakeholders engaged. Yeah? So that is the ethos and pathos part, right? Uh, so I think, uh, we, but I think we are not doing too badly, right? We are not doing too badly. We, we get quite a lot of praises uh, in the social media and elsewhere. And, but of course, we can be more influential. I think we are all aligned with that. Uh, and I think we are in a journey. We are in a journey. I think uh, we, we have a good start. Yeah. So, so I, I wouldn't be too self-critical, but I wouldn't be complacent. Uh, I wish we could do more, certainly do more and more influential, right? Uh, in many more publications and and in more decisions uh, around uh, decision-making bodies in the UK and throughout the world. Uh, so that is the journey yeah, uh, we, we, we are undertaking. Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, you and I obviously have been working quite closely together on some of this. And what struck me is that the, the best we can do is just take every opportunity that we can see and every opportunity that comes along. Um, you, you probably won't have seen because you were speaking, but um, just the, the panelists may be interested that uh, the CMI work that we've been doing on mortality um, actually got featured on uh, Sky News, uh, one of the broadcast news channels here in the UK last night. So I, 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 as, as you said, one swallow doesn't make a summer, um, but actually if we just keep taking those opportunities, um, and I guess we need all of our members as well where they see those opportunities or the conversations they're having uh, to, to also use those chances when they come along. Um, so that I think has, has addressed those questions. Um, a, a slightly different kind of COVID question um, now, and this is actually a, a question that was uh, submitted in advance, so it's obviously an important question for some of our members. Um, so it's talking about the fact that uh, across the world, obviously, vaccines uh, against COVID are now starting to be rolled out. Um, and the question is actually how soon uh, or indeed if, I suppose, we think the IFOA will go back to in-person examinations. Um, and, and I know obviously this, this sits very much uh, with the, the VSMD work that you've been doing. So I wonder if you could address that, you know, are, are we going back to in-person questions and exams once people have, have been vaccinated? My, my own inclination is that we should, uh, should go back better, yeah. So I think, uh, uh, to, uh, we, we should be as digital as possible. Uh, and I believe uh, certainly most of us at a leadership level think that uh, it would not be the right way to go back to what it was uh, because digital has so much advantages as long as we can eliminate some of the issues on authentication and, uh, uh, and plagiarization and so forth, yeah? which I think we are doing quite well. Yeah? Uh, so we can do that. Uh, and, and because the world is getting digital, uh, even if you have centers throughout the world, people still got to travel. Uh, people, especially in a, say in a country as big as India and China, travel is still uh, very significant. So my own inclination is that the goal is not to, uh, to go back uh, to in-person examinations. The goal is to make the digital part uh, uh, effective experience. Uh, and, and that should go not just for examinations, but in a way we do things. Yeah? Uh, do we need to have big meetings uh, in London all the time? We still need big, big meetings to get the in-person communication and building of relationships, but not for every meeting. I, I, I found that in my case, uh, that I was, I could be more effective uh, by not traveling for the last, for nearly a year now since I last traveled. Uh, but, but I wouldn't advocate that no travel at all. I wouldn't say that, but I would be a clever mix of that. And I think we've got to get our head around it, yeah, that we should be uh, more digital as a philosophy, uh, as a culture, uh, 
uh, as an organization because you will aid uh, access, uh, convenience, and also from a cost point of view, it will be more effective. And I, and I also wanted to link it to the previous question uh, about influence. Yeah? Because influence uh, is not just about activity. Yeah? Uh, but we cannot over expect because we are a professional body but we can be a bit different. We can be the best professional body in the world, right? Um, because uh, if you, uh, commercial organizations will, in terms of building culture and in terms of execution, will be easier to organize. Uh, it's harder in terms of professional bodies for many reasons, yeah? But it's possible to be better. And, and we could learn uh, in, in that doing because influence uh, is a function of content uh, and also form. Uh, and the way we communicate, uh, and, 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 and hence culture and governance comes to it because you need coherence and consistency. Uh, brand building and, and, and positioning of the profession cannot change from year to year, cannot change from year to year. It takes three to five to 10 years yeah, to build a consistent uh, brand. Hence, I, I like to see the work which is done this year as a continuation of the last four to five years and going into the future. And in this regard, I'm very pleased that uh, Luis is very aligned to this. Yeah. Thank you, Sweet Che. I, I, on, on the exam, exam point, um, I, I know we had a lot of very positive feedback about the move to digital, and you're right. Everything we're doing, we're trying to move it in, in, into a kind of much more digital way of working. So um, I, I hope that answers uh, the, the question for the person who asked it, uh, but, uh, but, but I think you've covered that well. You've also given me another brilliant segue uh, in those kind of latter comments you were making um, into a series of questions that we've had about governance. Um, so again, I'm just going to try and uh, group um, a few of these together. So uh, we've had what I think is a complementary question um, in that it says um, you seem to have been able uh, to get the, the council of 30 people to be quite agile um, in these circumstances of the last few months. Um, so there's a question about sort of how have you uh, managed to, uh, to lead council in a way that means they've been uh, agile. Um, and then I'm just going to pull together a couple of the other other questions. One which I know is a subject um, that, that I've heard you speak on before, uh, a, a person saying, uh, how can we make the kind of bold changes you talk about uh, when it's such a short tenure for the presidency? Uh, so maybe you can touch on that. Um, and then a final one, which is a lovely suggestion um, about uh, some governance changes uh, saying, I mean, this is quite radical. So this suggestion says maybe we have no council um, and we have a, a board of maybe around 10 non-executive actuaries uh, and the chief executive and then the executive, uh, you know, do the doing on a day to day basis. And the, and the questioner is asking for your view on that proposal for governance change. Uh, so, so how have you got council to be agile? What do you think about the length of term of the president's term? Um, and what about this uh, very radical suggestion for how we could change our governance? Uh, yeah, I, I, thanks. I, I saw the name uh, 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 who asked the question. There, there are three questions. Yeah. Um, we, uh, John, uh, Luis, and I put in a, a lot of time, more than the required time uh, of one or two days per week, a lot of time in our, uh, on a weekly basis. And we have the good fortune of uh, having uh, Graham and as well as Stephen uh, very aligned with our purpose. So there's a lot of engagement with council members. And, and, and council members want the best for the profession. There's no question about that but a third of them joins every year. And when they feel that we are actually working quite well, what is the issue, right? So, but, they, but, but the issue is uh, over time that they know. So, so, so there's quite a bit of turn, right? Uh, so the agility um, of the council is relative. Uh, I, I think we have made quite a number of, uh, a, a very experienced member of council, uh, Charles Carling told me, you know, you, you, you're, you're doing well. We have made so many decisions, uh, but, it's all a question of expectations. Obviously, there are still a lot of things to do. Uh, so, so the pacing uh, uh, is, is a one for judgment. But I also learned in my own uh, four years now, uh, yeah, there's a trade-off. Yeah, There's a trade-off. Yeah, uh, there, there is an impulse within the council for things to be uh, democratic and consensus. Then there is another impulse for things to be effective uh, and responsive. 
uh, and, and be slightly more hierarchical. And, and that comes from two different spaces. And, and you must get the balance right. Uh, I, I cannot say that going far to point B is the right answer and then going to point A is the right answer. Uh, the point A or one on consensus building, and I remember someone told me the council was 60 strong when the two bodies first merged. Uh, you're, you're, you're not going to make any mistakes, but you're not going to respond to change either. Yeah, if you need consensus from 30 people, right? So you need a healthy mix, yeah, you healthy mix. But you cannot go to one of the options uh, uh, suggested to, to make it a board. And that is one of the options we, we, we kick around because we, we are a member body and there is this high need uh, for members' views to be directly heard. But in between, I think there is uh, a trade-off because we, we need to be smart to respond to the changes outside. And trust becomes very important, right? Uh, how the members trust the council and how the council trusts the management board uh, and the CEO. And how the CEO and the management board earns the trust from the council, right? Uh, so that is all a function of behaviors, yeah? Uh, as long as the, those trust is in place, then we can be really responsive, right? Uh, and that is a journey, that's a journey. But in terms of governance, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, some, some easier things we could do, like the corporate board, uh, which we have already done. We could also uh, make um, uh, the council terms a bit longer, instead of three years, four years, or the presidential term a bit longer. Uh, those are not so controversial as changing the size of the council and so forth. Yeah? And, and, and the role of the council and the role of the management board needs to be in track well. I can't, uh, I can't over assert uh, any possible solution because every solution has its good points and they are not so good points. Yeah? Uh, but, I, but I feel relatively uh, content uh, with our progress given what I've heard, but I would like to see a bit further if it is possible in relation to management board in terms of the council. The second question uh, talks about given that the year, I, I knew the year is one year and, and for all the wisdom uh, and, 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 and Colin Wilson told me, uh, our past president told me, uh, there's merit in having two years and there's merit to have one, one year. If you don't have a good president, having a two-year two president is a nightmare. Yeah, so, so, so that was an interesting take, right? So you can't assume that every president will be a good president, yeah? But from my point of view, uh, I, I've been doing quite a bit of reflection because of Zoom, right? So I think that one of my central tasks uh, is to, to make sure that the narrative uh, is understood from, from generation to generation or from year to year. It is not so much of the decisions we take uh, and, and so much of the strategy and KPIs and all that, uh, but it's more about what, are we, what we have agreed to and why, what is our purpose and why. And if we can share the narrative at all levels of the organization, uh, then we, we don't really need too many rules uh, to make it work. So that is the one on, uh, on tenure. The last one was on governance change. What, what was the specific question on governance change? Uh, I can't remember the last question. No? So it was quite a radical proposal suggesting that we um, abolish the council, that we just have a, a kind of board um, of, uh, yeah. of maybe 10 or so people. So, so a, a variation of this, uh, you, you, you could actually enlarge the council and make it even more advisory. But currently the council has uh, strategic uh, powers uh, in terms of strategy intervention. You can make it advisory and delegate to the management board. So that would be a, one possible variation. But, but, but council has to be content with that. Then they must make sure that management board always reflect the wishes of the council. So that is, uh, in a sense, uh, equivalent to uh, devolving all the powers to the management board. But the other option is, of course, not to have the management board, have, and, but have an, a board which is elected from a membership. But then the question becomes, who has the time uh, to go in? Our issues, uh, our organization is not big in terms of revenue, uh, but in terms of population. But the complexity of the questions, the practice boards, the number of countries involved, uh, I don't think uh, members who are volunteers have the time to understand the issues. Uh, I think for the presidential team, to just go through the papers and understand the issues uh, will take a few years uh, to get to speed, right? So, so you can, uh, then, then, then the election of the board should be to a nominated process, which actually will impinge uh, on the democratic impulse 
uh, of the council. So these are all complex questions and it has received attention uh, over the last three or four years. Uh, and we are making progress. Yeah? And, and I think we got to be wise about this. Uh, and, and we are having external advice as well. Uh, so it, it remains an issue. It remains an issue. And I, I was very clear in my own uh, VSMD strategy. And I say that there's no way, because I, mean, I look at the past president, they're saying the same thing about skill sets and mindset. They're saying the same thing. I said, why has it not changed? And I then look into it. Uh, it's, it's the way the narrative is expressed. Is it tight enough? Is it explicit enough? And then, um, and I do have an issue certainly uh, in years gone by uh, with the way the executive respond, not, not deliberately, but they respond according to what is wanted, right? By the process, the consensus. And so people respond to what is requested. So now we want to be more customer centric. We want to be more outcome space. In the past, we want it to be agreed and to go through many agreements before we move into action in three different decision-making bodies, sometimes even five, you know, and even then we got checked check again, is this what we have agreed, you know, that's what we did without sounding too critical, but that was what we wanted. Yeah? And I say this with hope, all sincerity that it's not a reflection on individual executive or presidents, but I think it's a, a reflection on our, uh, on our core values of cautiousness and reticence. Yeah? So we just got to diversify I, I, and I think that we, we are the fly in a fly bottle. Yeah? Uh, what, uh, and, and we just got to be wise uh, uh, to fly out of the fly bottle or just walk out of the bottle. Yeah? Uh, so I think we are in that space. I think you've, in the answers that you've given there, you've, you've demonstrated in a way some of the complexities that as an organisation we have to deal with. And also, as you say, that often any suggestion or any solution that's put forward has its, has its positives, but also often has its kind of its pros and cons um, and, and trying to work out the, 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 the most pragmatic way forward is, is often the, the, the way. So I, I think we've addressed those questions. That's really great. Um, thank you. Uh, there's a, a question um, a, about kind of member engagement more widely. So it says it's been inspiring uh, to hear about about, uh, the vision and the practical things that are being done to make change happen. Uh, but the, the, uh, the member asks, how do you plan to engage all actuaries? Um, it seems that only a, quite a few members engage, uh, whereas really what we need is for many more members to engage. So a, a question about broadening member engagement, I think. I think it will be a collective effort. Uh, it will be a collective effort uh, for the leadership as well as the executives uh, to continue to engage through the Young Actuaries Forum, to the Disengage uh, Actuaries Forum, uh, and, and also some of the respected uh, past president uh, will engage them, and also people in Asia. Uh, uh, but but uh, uh, people who turn up in this uh, webinar, by definition, are, are closer to the circle uh, of uh, the heart of IFOA, by definition. And, and, uh, and I think we've got to be realistic. Uh, we are a professional body, uh, not, not a religious body or a, or a family, you know. Uh, and, we, and, and that's important to many of us who are working in the profession. But for the others, they, they, they are engagement with us probably once or twice a year when they do the CPD or subscription, you know. And, and in a way, I was a bit like that. And I was busy my, doing my CEO work, you know. Uh, so, so we don't judge them too harshly, but we should make our events interesting uh, and also our engagement exercise meaningful uh, that comes to ethos and pathos right uh, so we got to be more imaginative and and listen to them and you can't go for the all 100 percent because you know, but we can go for 30 40 percent and that is very big very big i i know a new uh, council member who was lamenting that the number of people who voted uh, last year for council elections was about 12 or 13 percent i can't remember the precise figures so i said that could you do a survey of other bodies and it came back they were all eight and nine seven or eight i said we are, we are about 50 percent higher so, so but it's still it's still not good it's still not good uh, but but so we have a sense of scale and proportion yeah so i think we should have a sense of scale and proportion about what we can do and what we can't do um, but we can certainly do more and i i i want to do more uh, for the profession uh, and, and one I have a way to certainly be more influential uh, that there's no question about it more influential in, in Asia in Malaysia Singapore where I come from and certainly in the UK uh, and Africa and, 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 and Asia because uh, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a wonderful profession and, and we have a lot to offer we have a lot to offer 
uh, and, and we must really capitalize on this yeah, because it will be uh, unwise or derelict of our responsibility if we don't capitalize on our heritage and our skills and and, and connections we have. We have a lot of supporters, yeah. So, so we should we should do that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm hoping this is a relatively straightforward question. It's really a, 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 a very simple request uh, to say that they think uh, that the launch of the Chartered Actuary title uh, is something that would be very popular, particularly with, uh, with students and new actuaries coming through. And the question is simply, can you give us any update uh, on what is happening with Chartered Actuary? The, the, I think Charter actually is a great opportunity for us to, to protect our name and brand and, and, and the fact that we are the only body which can have that, uh, it, would be, uh, it would be very positive yeah, uh, for the body. So as far as the council is concerned, they, they want that I vote, uh, I vote to have chartered. Yeah? And, and in recent uh, months, uh, we, we are working and I think it's still contingent on the reply from the um, Privy Council, because all these changes require changes to articles and approval from the Privy Council. And we are working along uh, tracks where we could use the word chartered uh, for both fellows and associates uh, at the same time by calling the, the fellows chartered fellows and calling the associates chartered actuaries because they are already actuaries. So that is that track. And I think that is the primary uh, purpose. Uh, and, and it is also a source of uh, differentiation and protection of our name. But I also think that it is also a, a good way to frame uh, uh, the profession from a VSMD point of view. Uh, the, the fellows are our, our surgeons, our specialists uh, working in life insurance, in risk and so forth. Uh, but there's an opportunity for people who want to be GPs, yeah? uh, which I see the, who, who understand basic rules of, of actual science and can apply in different fields. And they could have new types of fellows in the future. Uh, we have a certificate, uh, we got a pathway to, well, we will have a pathway to fellow in banking and so forth. So that's how I see it. So we are still very keen uh, in protecting the name of, uh, of actuaries uh, in the UK. Uh, and, and there's still, uh, the work is actually contingent on uh, P, uh, Privy Council approval. Yeah. So it's very much uh, along our pathway. Yeah, so, so, so it sounds as though the work is progressing, uh, but it, it takes time to get through things like the Privy Council process. Um, so a, a question for you, and I'm keeping an eye on the clock as I know we're getting close to, to our time, um, but I know this is, this is a subject that I know is always close to your heart um, uh, and has genuinely been asked, uh, which is what advice do you have for newly qualified actuaries? Okay, uh, by, by definition, uh, you, you've got to start about uh, uh, knowing yourself. Uh, what, what you uh, know yourself is uh, a Delphic oracle, right? Uh, from, from Greece, right? And, and it's very important because such advice, you've got to be knowing yourself. And I could say this quite quickly because I'm thinking of my presentation later in the week. <laughs> knowing yourself was the first thing. You must know what, what you want. Yeah? But I think a general advice, uh, and I couldn't give you more. Uh, my teacher told me, uh, uh, interest is the soul of knowledge. Yeah? And actually, um, Steve Jobs said, uh, be, stay hungry, stay foolish. So follow your passion. Uh, and I couldn't say this more. You Be, be passionate in what you do. Uh, uh, this advice is for, for young actually to, to do what? what? What do they want to be? Uh, did, did, was it in a question? What was the question? It, it just says, what advice would you have for newly qualified actuaries? That is okay. good. I, but, but you see, okay, the general advice, it has to be general because I don't know where's the angle because I'm into personality types because different personality will take this advice differently. Yeah. So, so, so but generally, follow your passion. Uh, and, I, and I think that, in my view, don't give up on, on the depth of actuarial science. I, I sort of gave up slightly when I went to I, uh, become a CEO. Because I, I think you can be a specialist and a generalist, right? But but without being overdoing it, yeah. Because I, I think you got to keep your eyes open to the wider world. But at the same time, don't do, don't say that oh I'm I'm not I'm not into this, yeah. Because I think uh, that is your foundation. So you, you need two pillars. So uh, so so the first piece is stay passionate in in what you do. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is because passion is at excellence, yeah. So from an actual standpoint. Uh, stay close to the profession, but at the same time, wander as far out as you want to. 
and and continue to be a member. That's that's the first advice. Yeah. I was just about to say that I think that very broad advice is good advice, whether you're an actuary or not. Uh, so, but hopefully that's been helpful for, I imagine uh, that the questioner is themselves a newly qualified actuary. So I, I hope that's been helpful. Um, Suiche, I think we've got time for maybe one last question. Um, so what I wanted to ask you as your final question um, is what is your personal kind of single biggest priority for the next six months? So we've talked this morning about the last six months. What is the number one thing you're focused on for the next six months? I, I think uh, if, you, if you want it to be very specific, uh, uh, because most of the goals I have extend into Louis year and the years after. So I, I think the governance arrangements are be quite keen to make some progress, certainly on the management board uh, uh, and, and also council terms. I'm quite keen to make some progress. They'll, they'll be concrete, yeah. Uh, but the others, although they are not concrete, uh, the, the next six months are going to be vital, right? On, on, on the way we talk about Moonshot, uh, on the way we talk about offering, uh, and the way uh, Stephen Graham and the presidential team talk about culture change, uh, because that is uh, providing the narrative and the support uh, for change, right? And I, and I use the analogy, the metamorphosis of, uh, of IOA as the metamorphosis of a butterfly. We are, we are really in a, in a lava stage, right? We are, we are not going to a pupa stage. So, so there are lots of fermentation. And whether we go into a pupa or not, it's really not decided yet. I would like to see uh, that we go into a, the pupa stage, right? And, and there are some elements around that. Like it's around member value proposition, culture change and all that. So, 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 so for me, it is a continuation of the narrative. You could sense it, uh, whether uh, that takes root. But on a very specific level, I would say governance, which is I think council and, uh, and, and management board. And I think the changes in management board is likely to happen, but I, 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 but I do not have the ultimate authority on that. It will be done collectively. And the second one is on membership uh, value proposition. Uh, our members, um, Obviously, uh, I'm very happy to remember, so, but I think we've got to define our proposition and our value to our members in different segments uh, uh, more sharply. Uh, you are, I'm continue to be a member because uh, I, I, I love IOA because uh, in different groups in different parts of the world. Uh, that is a work in progress. Uh, so there's something which could be done during the next three to six months uh, and whether to areas like fees or webinars, which is I know contentious for some of our members because it's not about fees, it's about the value we get. And I like to think as a whole, uh, we, are we are providing great value, yeah? uh, but we need to express it uh, maybe better and maybe sharpen in some of the way we frame it. Yeah? Thank you. That's been very clear about what you're going to be focused on then for the next six months. And I think it also reflects um, many of the, the questions that we, we've had in. So uh, clearly everything is very well aligned uh, between your priorities and the things that our members are asking questions about. Um, Suiche, I'm, I'm going to draw this to a close. Um, I, I know that um, everyone who's on the session um, has probably got a, a busy schedule uh, that they need to get back to. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone who has attended and particularly those of you who've sent us through questions and also comments. Um, I, I, so I, I would like to reassure people we do read everything. Uh, we do take on board uh, everything that you've sent through to us. I'm sorry that we don't, we kind of never have time to get to every question, but thank you very much for for what you've sent through um, and on behalf um, of everyone who's been listening in Suiche may I on their part say thank you to you for taking the time to update the membership um, on the progress that's been made um, and how your presidential year is is progressing uh, so thank you and thank you to our participants uh, and uh, we will keep you updated through as many channels as we can as we go forward thank you thank all you very much, much.